welcome into another episode of Everything is Logistics, a podcast for the thinkers in freight. We are proudly presented by SPI Logistics, and I am your host, Blythe Brumley. Today, I am happy to welcome in Kevin Lawton. He is the founder and host of the New Warehouse podcast, and we're going to be talking about, well, you, you, you guessed it, we're going to be talking about warehouses. <laughs> And then we're also going to be talking about content, the content creation process, um, and uh, kind of the growth of content creation within the logistics industry as a whole, which has been super fascinating to watch over the last few years. So, Kevin, welcome into the show. Yes, Blythe. Happy to uh, be on the show and, and happy to, to finally connect with you, too. I know we've been going back and forth for a while, and it, I feel like I, I know you very well from listening to your show, um, and so, so it's great to be a guest on and, and definitely happy to uh, be on, uh, I guess, the, the other side of the mic here a little bit, too, as well, we could say. Heck, yeah. Is, is yeah. this your first, like, other side of the coin interview? Uh, no, no, I've done a couple other ones, um, but I, I've just kind of started trying to do that in the past year or so, um, as like I've kind of figured out my podcast and got it in a bit of a, a system, uh, <laughs> and now like, you know, trying to get on other people's podcasts and, and, uh, especially more, more too, as like more and more podcasts in our space have been coming out as well. Like there's been more opportunity to do that, I think. Yeah, you you definitely coming in with the the branded merch here for those who are just listening. Oh, yeah. You got the 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 new warehouse shirt on, and then you also have a really cool sign in the background. It looks oh, like it was yeah, made yeah. out of like metalworks or something. Yeah, actually, that's part of our uh, booth that we take to conferences. Um, it's like a sign, and uh, here in New Jersey, there's a, a local artist that made the whole booth for me, and he did that. Um, it is metal uh, off of, uh, which has been like plasma cut, and huh. and then he built this sign kind of behind that to be uh, palette-esque, I guess we could call it, yes, or pa palette chic, maybe, we'll throw that out there, I don't know. <laughs> No, that's definitely yeah, keeping it on brand for sure. Because I, yeah. I mean, I noticed the the metal part, but I didn't notice the pallet part until you you just mentioned it. So yeah, very in, in industrial chic. Yes, definitely a little <laughs> subtle pallet hint there. I'll say. <laughs> Now, for folks who, who may not have listened to your show, I, I think your show is fantastic. It's one of, that's made it into my regular rotation, um, especially when it comes to logistics industry podcasts. But for folks who may not be aware of like you or your origin story, give us a sense of, of how you got into the logistics industry as a whole. Sure, definitely. I, I mean, I think like uh, most people... Uh, I found my way into the logistics industry not on purpose. Uh, <laughs> I didn't like, you know, grow up or anything trying to, uh, you know, pack boxes or anything like that. I wasn't, I wasn't doing that on the playground pretending mm -hmm. uh, that I was in a warehouse or anything. Um, I, I went to school for, for entrepreneurial studies and then, uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew at one point I wanted to have my own business. Um, and but then I graduated and then, you know I needed a job I needed to work uh, so uh, through somebody I knew uh, there was a, a temp position as a inventory control uh, specialist at a, a book publisher here in New Jersey um, at their distribution facility so I took that role um, quickly got offered a, a full time position um, so really started in the inventory control arena uh, of logistics and, and warehousing. Um, and then kind of enjoyed that, took to that, like with the, the numbers and everything. And then, you know, spending time uh, kind of really uh, harnessing and developing my Excel skills and, and working in Microsoft Access, kind of data mining and then translating that into the physical processes of the warehouse itself, too. Um, so I, I spent some time there and then uh, moved on to another company where uh, I got more involved in the warehouse operations side um, and then eventually became a um, warehouse operations manager, inventory control manager, um, plant manager for a while as well. Uh, but somewhere uh, along the line, because at first I was like, ah, this isn't my career, right? This isn't my career. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something else in the back of my head. Um, and then at some point I was like, let me embrace this a little bit, right? So then I went um, and I was like, how do I learn more about this industry? And uh, I was, uh, I guess I'm like my late 
20s at that point so you know I was looking for something interesting I think this was like 2017 2018 like that I could digest and uh, I had been like very into blogs when I was younger I was uh, big into like sneaker collecting in, in high school early college so all the information I would get from blogs and things like that so my first thought is like let me find some cool blogs that are talking about warehousing and logistics right and at that time uh <laughs> it was pretty much non-existent right it was like uh you take like an old trade publication and just regurgitate it online and in digital form and i was like oh this is like not interesting like i'm not uh getting much enjoyment out of, of trying to find this so uh so funny enough like i had a, a friend college roommate who was working for uh company called Autoblog, um, which was, I think, I think a, Yah a Yahoo company or something like a blog. They ran about cars and things like that. And he was doing uh, part of their social media stuff. And I was looking at that and thinking like, oh, how come there's like not something like this for, for industry side? Like how do we take this kind of idea and make some interesting content around that side of things? So, so my initial thought was uh, I'll start a blog uh, about warehousing and and I quickly realized, like, uh, I don't have time to sit down and, and write and then edit and figure out the distribution. And, you know, I was working full time as an operations manager and we had just uh, started a new facility and we were putting all this automation in. It was like super long days trying to get everything up and running and fix issues from go live. Uh, so I was like, I don't have time for this. And. Me and my boss, um, who actually we, we worked together for a long time, and he's actually uh, he's a guest on episode two of the podcast. Actually, <laughs> um, uh, he brought me along with him for like three different jobs, actually uh, three different companies. Um, so we had a very good relationship, and I had been talking to him about this idea, um, and he's the one that was like, "Why don't you do a podcast?" Like I hear podcasts are getting big, right, and, and they're taking off, and all these things. This was like. I guess like late 2018. Um, so I thought about it. I'm like, hmm, okay. Like that could be easier, right? I sit down, talk into a microphone instead of having to sit down and, and write um, and then edit too. Like I don't have to edit too much with the podcast, right? So, so yeah, so I decided to, to try it. Um, and then in, in 2019, that's when uh, we, we launched the, the first episode uh, of the New Warehouse uh, podcast. And it's kind of just taken off from there. But um, yeah, my background is very much rooted in uh, what I talk about on the podcast warehousing. So so how long did it did it take you to go from the idea being suggested to you to the first episode being launched? Uh, I think it was a couple months, I would say. Um, so I, I guess a part of my background too, um, is that I, I was working part-time in, in real estate as well. Um, and through that, um, at my alma mater, Ryder University, um, there was a, an opportunity there to do a, a real estate radio show. Um, so I had done that in the past. So I had some like, uh, experience on the mic right um but none of the behind the scenes thing there was like student producers like i would you know roll in for an hour once a week do my thing student producer take care of everything oh else, that's right? the great that's the best <laughs> yeah so so i had like that experience on the mic and and to be honest with you like uh, you know very comfortable now speaking on the mic you know networking with people going to conferences and all this stuff but but prior to that um, I was not very good at that. Like I, I would be, you know, very kind of anxious in, in group settings or networking opportunities, trying to talk to people. Um, and doing that or original radio show was a way for me to step outside of my comfort zone and, and push me to that. Uh, because I thought like, mm, like I talked to the microphone, it's not really like I'm talking to people, but I am in a way, I guess. So I, I build up my comfort level through that. Um, so then, yeah, so then it took me a couple of months to kind of, you know, I guess convince myself that I do want to do <laughs> the podcast, I guess, like, you know, is this a project I want to take on? Um, and so I, I figured it out and, and I got like a, a mic and then, uh, you know, I tried to figure all the, the tech side of it, which like I say, like, I'm not very good at that audio tech and everything like that. Um, so I, I ended up uh, luckily, uh, I needed like a quiet space to record in. Um, and at the time my son was like, 
I want to say he was, he was 2019, so he was like five, six. Um, so he really didn't understand that, like, hey, dad's <laughs> in the basement. Like, he can't be, like, running around upstairs because he's trying to record something. Right? He didn't get it, right? So, so I'm like, oh, I need a quiet space. So I found a co-working space locally. And it just so happened when I was registering for the co-working space, um, the the manager there was like, "Oh, you should meet this guy. He's uh, he does podcasts too." Uh, so I met him, and and he kind of really showed me how to do everything. Uh, he set me up with like how to create an RSS feed, and you know, come up with all the distribution. And, and he had like his own kind of independent. Uh, hosting platform at the time um, so I I went through him initially and he kind of really showed me all the ropes and, and all that stuff and that kind of that kind of made it a little easier for me um, and then yeah and then from there it was kind of I guess it just kept going and going and going and you know here we are like four years later 400 plus episodes later um, and it's been a, a pretty wild ride I never thought like it, it would go this far but uh, it keeps going so, so is it uh, like a, I don't want to say because I call myself like a full time podcaster now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take up, I guess, traditional like full time, you know, a traditional like yeah. eight to five, you know, Monday through Friday. It's a lot of weekends. It's a lot of nights. It's uh, varying hours. Um, it's a lot of travel to, to conferences is are, are you managing like other roles? Because I, I know that you're also a professor, mm -hmm. too, right? So yeah. are you managing those roles on top of the podcast as well? Yes, yeah. So for uh, for the first three first three years of the podcast, like I was still working the nine to five um, as a warehouse manager, and then mm -hmm. like I would be done at like four o'clock, and I would like bolt home and record like uh like a podcast at like five four thirty five o'clock um and i would do that maybe like three three or four nights a week to do that and then i would you know spend time family time do whatever i needed to do and then like you said late nights like stay up trying to get things together do the blog post that goes with the episode um and i, I did find um Actually, a, a student uh, was able to hire um, initially as an intern. He was able to get credits um, to do like the audio production editing for me. Um, and actually, he still still works for me now, like as a, as a contractor all this time. And he he does all the editing and everything for the audio. Um, and so that that was helpful, definitely, kind of like delegating that piece because I. I tried in the beginning to figure out the audio editing and I was just like, this is not for me. <laughs> like, I don't have the patience for this. And, and I'm a pretty patient guy, but I was like, you know, this is not lining up with this. And uh, like, I got to get somebody to, to do this for me. Um, so, so yeah, for a very long time I was managing that. Um, and then I started teaching as well. So I was managing that additionally. Um, but then as of last year in March, um, I went full time, uh, with the new warehouse. Um, so I, I do the podcast through the new warehouse. Um, I do teach as well, as you mentioned, um, as an adjunct professor, um, I, I teach one, one course in person, one, uh, virtually, um, uh, but actually this semester I'll be teaching, uh, two in person and one virtually at, uh, Ryder University supply chain courses. Um, and yeah, and then we also, at the same time that I went, left my, uh, I guess, corporate gig, you could say, uh, and, and went full time like entrepreneur, uh, we also launched a fulfillment center under the New Warehouse brand too, huh. as well. Um, so yeah, so it's managing all of that uh, <laughs> at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's like, a, it's like a nonstop kind of uh, thing. But it's, it, it, it's all over the place. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's organized in a way. What I, you could say it's like organized chaos a, a yes. little bit from time to time. Yeah, <laughs> That's logistics in a nutshell, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very, very similar uh, <laughs> to the actuality of what we're talking about, yeah. So you, you uh, the podcast is called The New Warehouse. Why mm -hmm. that, uh, why new in, in the name? Sure. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting because I, I was trying to figure out what do I call this, right? And um, and I was starting to look around more in the industry. Um, and I think one thing, too, uh, that I 
quickly realized um, when I was getting this started uh, is that, you know, a lot of people, they work for the same company um, for, for a long time, you know, multiple years, um, and they only get necessarily exposure to the technology and things that are happening that their company is interested in or, or willing to invest in, right? So, so I started seeing like, oh, there's a lot more technology happening in our space than I really even realized as just someone that was working in the space, right? So, so I started to think like, oh, I kind of want to highlight more of that. Um, so it was the idea, I think in this, first we were talking about like the modern, modern warehouse or, or something like that. And, and then, uh, I think one of my friends was like, well, what about like new warehouse or something like that? And, and so it's really the idea of like, what does that, uh, new warehouse look like, right? What does the, you know, what's the newest thing that's coming out and, and how is technology playing a role within the, the warehouse environment? Um, so it's really that, that newness of the tech around that and, and kind of what's happening within the, the space. And so as you're, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, launching this show or you're not launching the show, but you, you've, you've launched it in 2019 and mm. now you're at a point where it is a full-time focus for you. So what does sort of, I guess, your, your cadence look like, um, or a typical work week look like you, you said that you're, you're teaching classes, yeah. um, you know, two in, in person, one virtually, but how do you fit in like the podcast in between all of that? Like, what does a typical work week look like for you? <laughs> if that exists. Uh, yeah, typical. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I do have a, a virtual assistant that helps me um, now that I, I've hired this year. Um, and we actually had a meeting yesterday talking about this because she's like, you need to like, you need to like get a schedule like going because you're just like <laughs> taking meetings left and right. And then you're here and then you're there. It's like, you need to kind of say like, okay, these are when my meetings <laughs> the are VA is be. having an intervention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I told her too, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you need to just like take the calendar over and this is like, <laughs> like figures out for me. Um, but no, I, I mean, it is like a lot of bouncing around, but what I've been able to figure out and why I've been able to take on like additional projects like the teaching and like the fulfillment business as well um, is because uh, over time uh, I kind of take you know from a very into um, and still very into um, standardization within operations and, and warehousing and standard work and I actually uh, maybe this makes me like a crazy nerd but I actually really like creating standard works and standard operating procedures um, so I, I kind of at some point it kind of like clicked I'm like well why don't I you know take that kind of systemization and, and systematic kind of belief and, and apply it to the podcast too right like why don't I these things that I'm doing you know repetitively like why don't I just figure out okay like if I'm doing this all the time like let me create either like a you know a document that I can use every time and you know how do I organize this in, in that way so it's like the same step same processes every time so I've been able to do that and then also uh, leaving the the nine to five typical nine to five job um, that's also allowed me to have these kind of batch uh, recording sessions so for me when I do um, podcast uh, typically like I will take one or two days a month um, and on those two days all I will do is just record uh, episodes so so I'll schedule people uh, sometimes two or three months in advance um, with them and then that day like I'll do five or six episodes in one day like I'll just I just sit right here on the microphone like all day <laughs> and that's it. Um, and then like I'm good for a while because mm -hmm. we do we do an episode every Monday and Wednesday. Um, so that covers me for, for a while. So like so as of right now, we're recording this like in the beginning of August, like I'm good through uh, pretty much the end of October right now. So oh, like, wow. So I, I learned at one point because there was too many times I was scrambling like last minute trying to hit like the release schedule. Like it was like, uh, like if you go like way back in the library, like there's pretty much every episode I have, there's a guest. Um, I think maybe there's four that is just me solo. Um, and those were like, 
Uh, we were releasing episodes in the beginning just on Mondays, and that was those are like recorded probably at like midnight on Sunday, like <laughs> like oh I need an episode, so like let me just come up with something and just uh, improv here. So so yeah, I learned that like I'm like oh, I don't like the the scramble part, so I'm like how do I address that? And that's really where that kind of batch recording idea came from. Um, so I do that, and then like a, a weekly cadence. Um, I, I mean, I have been able to kind of hire some contractors and have like a small team uh, as well that helped me out. Um, so I have somebody. So kind of the things that I was seeing that were time consuming and not necessarily the most enjoyable part. I mean, the most enjoyable part for me is is talking to the people, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's what I like to do. I like to have the conversation and, and learn um, within the podcast. So. So like the writing of the blog post, like I have someone that does that for me now. Um, the audio production, I mentioned I have someone that does that. And then uh, my VA, she uh, kind of coordinates all that and, and does the project management side of that. Um, so that's really helped to kind of, you know, th- uh, thin out my days a little bit. But I still, um, you know, like on Sunday, uh, Sunday night, usually before we release the episode on Monday, like I'm going through and I'm, I'm reading the blog post, making some tweaks here and there. Um, and then same thing Tuesday before the Wednesday episode. And then really now, uh, for the podcast side, there's more focus on, uh, we started a video series on, on Fridays. Um, so it's more focused on trying to figure out how to get that more, which we've been pretty good at, at having it almost every Friday. Um, just trying to build up that content and, and get that going and get that to a point where uh, it's it's something in addition to the audio podcast that people are interested in. Uh, so my typical week, uh, aside from the podcasting stuff, like I'm... I'm in and out of our, our warehouse, um, helping out there, picking, packing orders, um, especially the summer. And summer is good. I'm not teaching in the summer, so I have a little extra time. Uh, but the past couple weeks has been crazy because we just moved into a, a new warehouse, actually, ironically there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, So that's been a little crazy, moving from the old space and getting that up and running. Um, but yeah, typically, like, I'll... I'll either set up meetings like in the morning and then I'll pop into the warehouse for a couple hours and maybe I might do some meetings from there. I might be on the floor picking and packing, doing some process improvement. Um, and then, yeah, and then really the podcast is kind of mm, almost on, I wouldn't say fully autopilot, but um, it is at a point where it's very like um, systematic in, mm. in that process. Um, so there is like more time now where we're focusing on trying to see what other opportunities are there for the podcast, you know, in terms of like working with companies, whether, you know, whether it's sponsorship or figuring out how do we do something creative by like getting on site with them and really kind of showcasing a little more through, through video. So there's more focus on like building in, in different ways, um, than like actually kind of getting that audio podcast done. Like, cause it is at the point now where it's like, oh, I sit down and do the conversation and then upload the file and you know, the team takes it away basically. So, so I don't know if that really gives any idea into what my week looks like, but, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of like the balance in between, um, everything. And then, and then when I'm teaching, uh, I teach on Monday and Wednesday. So, uh, I kind of focus like, Monday, uh, before teaching, like I'll be in the warehouse cause I'm, you know, I have like half a day. So I'm like, Oh, let me spend time there. Wednesday, the same thing. Uh, and then, yeah, and then I go and teach and, and figure out the rest, uh, in between. Do you find that you're since, you know, COVID and like sort of, mm-hmm. I guess, general supply chain awareness, um, has increased since, especially since the, you know, the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal. Do you find that like your students yeah. are more interested in just supply chain in general? Yeah, I think absolutely. It, it's interesting because um, the one class that I've been teaching um, and, and the second class I'm going to be teaching this semester is is new to me to teach. Um, but it the one that I've been teaching is a mix of uh, it's a supply chain focused course, but it's a mix of regular business students and supply chain majors. So it's been interesting to see, and I started 2021 was my first semester. Um, so like right 
uh, it was the first semester that they were back in person, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so it is interesting to see over those couple semesters, like how uh, the regular business students, um, their awareness has certainly, I think, increased in, in supply chain. Um, and also, you know, some of the things that they're, they're interested in knowing about, um, like there's, you know, in the beginning, like it was kind of like, oh, do you guys know that, you know, we use robots and, and automation and all these things in, in supply chain. And, you know, it was like not that awareness. And now it's people are like, oh, are we gonna, you know, learn anything about robots or, or automation <laughs> in this class? Right. Uh, so it was definitely like more awareness, I, I think overall. Um, and even like, uh, even I say like just in general, like people, uh, like in the general public too, like, I think there's just more, more awareness too. Like I, when I started the podcast and telling friends and family, they're like, you're going to do a podcast about what? Like, who's going <laughs> to listen to that? Right. And now they're like, now they're like, Oh, like my, like my friends from college, we have a group chat. And like, uh, when some of that stuff was happening, they're like, they're like, Oh, what are you going to do about this? Like, <laughs> and I'm like well, I didn't cause the problem. Right. I'm just right. talking about it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's certainly, it's really an increased awareness around that. And I think we're seeing too, like as a supply chain department at the university, like more interest in incoming freshmen wanting to pick that as a major, whereas previously, uh, it was like business majors were switching over sophomore and junior year because they chose to take intro to supply chain as uh, like an elective or something like that. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I, I it's been awesome watching just the growth of like, I guess, sort of the younger millennial, like Gen Z interest in supply chain, because even like posting yeah. like certain content to TikTok, uh, it, it, like retail majors, I did a story on like the logistics of lipstick and the retail majors that were watching that video and then sharing it with their colleagues, just mm. they didn't have any idea about that side of the, the, the process. And so I think it's just, it's one of those things that you don't realize, it's almost like the CIA where you don't realize, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's around, supply chain is around until something messes up. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's it's pretty wild. I mean, you see, I'm not, I haven't ventured into the TikTok side <laughs> yet, uh, <laughs> but um, you should. Robotics would kill it on there. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking. We, we've been trying to. We've been like really focused in on on LinkedIn, um, and, and we're just now kind of looking at like how do we. Because we've been getting like more video content now, so now we're trying to see like, okay, how do we like disseminate that in, in different ways? Whether it's you know Instagram Reels or or TikTok potentially, um, but yeah, but like even personally, like I'm not on TikTok either, so I'm like very like not familiar <laughs> with it. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it's pretty wild to to see that and how some of these things that are involved in our space are getting picked up like from a like a, I guess you could say a mainstream perspective as well i think it's pretty fascinating like even um uh like cory connors right like he has like a big tiktok thing going on around corrugated pa sustainable packaging, packaging. <laughs> yeah corrugated i think he's called on there right? <laughs> yes. and it, like yeah i mean it, it's crazy like who would think that you know some like packaging stuff would just like catch so much, much attention and blow up but it's pretty fascinating like what the newer generations are like really interested in and it's pretty pretty amazing i think so when you're thinking about, I guess the, I guess from the lens of a warehouse operator, mm -hmm. what does the state of warehousing sort of look like right now? Is it a lot like trucking, where you have some companies who are, you know, diving headfirst into technology, and then other companies are are just resisting? Is the is it similar, or is it safe to say that that's kind of happening in warehousing too? Oh yeah, I would say it's very similar because I I think. You know, warehousing uh, for a long time and, and, you know, traditionally, like when you look at the small to medium sized warehouse company, um, uh, small to medium sized shipper, you know, that's very traditional in a, in a sense, you could say, and, and pretty old school. Like, you know, they've been around for a long time and 
they've always done things this way, uh, which is, you know, a terrible phrase to say. I will say that directly to the camera. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you, you know, I think it's like, you know, oh, well, you know, we've been uh, running our business this way for, you know, 20 years. Like, you know, why do we need to bring in robots or why do we need to bring in automation or, you know, systems or like, why do we even need to get rid of our spreadsheets and get a WMS or, or something like that, right? I think it's, it, it definitely is that contrast, but definitely you see like tons of companies that are, are diving in, like you said, head first into the automation and, and robotics. Um, but I, I think we are at sort of a, a pivot a little bit where these small and medium sized businesses are starting to look and say like, hey, like I think I do need to figure this out and I do need to put this in my, my roadmap. Um, and, and I think part of that too is if you look at some of the uh, barriers of entry, you know, in the past couple of years, it was certainly like huge operational, uh, huge uh, capex um, investments in that, um, which the robotics companies, I think, have taken notice, um, mm -hmm. certainly, and, and they've, you know, moved to more um, pricing models that are like uh, robotics as a service, which is essentially like a leasing the robot, or even some companies are now doing like pay per pick and, and all these different things. So, so I think like those are, are pushing people more toward that. And I think even if you look at some of the conferences too, I mean, you know, you, uh, the first conference I went to was 2019, shortly after I started the podcast actually. Um, and there was like a couple companies with robots and now like I went to ProMat this year in uh, March and yeah, it was like, uh, every other booth if not every booth had like some kind of robot in it so it's like you you can't escape it um but i think that yeah i think definitely there's that pivot happening um and i think a lot of it too uh is because more of the uh, i think at first like there was a, a little friction contrast because like the robotics high-tech side of the warehousing industry was like coming from like a, like a startup, you know, Silicon Valley type, right, who, who maybe necessarily had um, the idea for the tech, um, but then found the practical application within our world, the warehousing world, logistics world, um, but never really spent time in a warehouse or, or had that kind of background. Um, but now you're seeing where like that's being embraced and, and they're really starting to understand like, okay, how do these really apply in here and, and how can they work for these shippers to, to start to implement them and, and you know, augment their facilities to, to be ready for like the future. Yeah, I, I think you, you made a great point about sort of the, the conference landscape and how mm. robotics has kind of just taken over. Because, you know, I, I got my start in freight working at an asset-based trucking company. Right. So I didn't even really know about the maritime silo or the warehousing silo or the intermodal silo. And using this podcast is kind of like a way for me to explore the, those different silos and how they're all interconnected into logistics and just sort of the greater you know, overall supply chain. But I wasn't – I didn't know, I guess, the – the coolness factor of robotics until I went to mm. the first manifest conference yeah. and out in Vegas where they had a true sort of expo floor where you could see these demos, you could see ro you know, robotics with like the, the picking and the packing and the sorting. And, um, you know, I think even, you know, at this year's conference, they had spot, you know, from Boston dynamics, yeah. you know, even though I, I don't know that they have really anything to do with like warehousing or, you know, <laughs> traditional ro warehouse robotics, but it was just right. cool to see, that growth of that sector and part of uh, I think maybe why the sector hasn't grown faster than it should is definitely reasons that, that you just listed but I also think from like a psychological level like I, I've, mm. I've heard of like a Six River Systems that they host uh, regular yeah. webinars it's a, a, a warehouse robotics company and they were talking about how part of their onboarding in, uh, includes a, the psychological component of training the employees to look at the robots as helpers oh, and yeah. not someone that's going to take their jobs. Do you see that as still like that psychological barrier still existing or do you see it kind of, you know, that that's a worry of kind of yesterday? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, like you said, like the, 
the robots they grab your attention and you know they're very cool uh definitely uh, and it's cool to be i think working in an industry that's able to see that kind of technology in a, in a practical application um but certainly there is that huge um change management aspect to it uh, and I think that's a very, very important thing um, to, to be focused on as an operator that's going to be bringing in robotics and automation and, and being able to explain that to the employees. Uh, because I, I would say from my experience um, in, in actually the in the position that I, I left to, to go, you know, full entrepreneur mode, um, we were looking at some uh, robotics to, to bring in and, and we had brought one in um, just as a, a demo. Um, and like almost immediately, like one guy on the forklift drove up and he's like, oh, you're, you're bringing in that thing to take my job, right? Like right away. And this was, you know, this was only uh, a year or so ago. So, so I, I mean, I think there's still definitely that um, skepticism, but I, I think from the point of view of like a leadership level, um, I think the skepticism is, is gone in that aspect, but I think it is the employee that's on the floor doing that day-to-day -day work that uh, a robot or automation solution is going to uh, either like augment their job in some way or change what their job looks like that is skeptical. But it's really, really important to, as you develop that plan to bring that in, include change management within that. Like how are you going to explain to your employees why you're doing this, right? And, and the reality is that, you know, I think if we look at it, uh, there's very few, I think, cases where, you know, they're completely like taking people out of the warehouse, right? It's more in the sense of, you know, they're making people more productive because it's uh, assisting them with travel time or the pick time. It's taking away repetitive tasks, things that, you know, traditionally people don't even really want to do anyway. So, you know, it's really important to come in, uh, and explain that before you just, you know, just plop a, a robot on the floor and <laughs> say, oh, this is a new way we're, we're working, right? Because then you're going to you're gonna get met with some some friction, definitely, because people are going to, you know, be thinking like, hmm, like once this thing is up and running, like am I out of here in like a month or something like that? Um, which I think is, you know, pretty most of the times not, not the case. Um, but it is important to, to set that precedent and, and explain you know, why are we going this route? Like, why are we starting to use these different types of tools that, you know, maybe change what you do um, a little differently? With all the conversations that you've had on your show, and then also mm -hmm. from the experience of managing a warehouse, what do you think sort of the next, what, maybe the next five years, or maybe the ideal relationship between, you know, automation and AI and a warehouse worker, what does that sort of perfect marriage look like? Ooh, the perfect marriage. Hmm. If that um, exists. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, what does the Disney I, warehouse look like? <laughs> the Disney warehouse. Uh, there's lots of uh, fairy dust and, and things floating around. Uh, Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean the I think the the perfect marriage there is really where you're figuring out how to kind of get your your core team um, in there, like your top performers, and then how do you make their job better, right? And then how do you also, you mentioned AI in there, like how do you also, you know, make better decisions faster, right? So, so you're bringing the robotics in to help, you know, replace those jobs and tasks that, like I said, people, you don't really like doing anyway. Um, you know, I think that the industry says the dull, dirty and dangerous, right, is, you know, getting uh, rid of those types of tasks and allowing them to kind of elevate a little bit in their role. Um, and I think, you know, we see over the past couple of years, there's, there's so much discussion about, you know, shortage of labor, you know, getting people to even want to work in warehouses, right? So, and I think that's going to become, you know, even bigger and bigger because there's more opportunities out there. There's different types of flexibility that people can have. And, you know, going to, you know, stand on a concrete floor and then pick or pack orders all day long is, you know, becoming less and less appealing, right? So, so that you have your top performers and, you know, if you have them understanding the robotics or the automation that you've put in place and how they can work with that and become, you know, 
you know, however much more productive. Um, I think that you're seeing probably a, a leaner team uh, with that um, and a team that, you know, sees the value in there and really enjoys that work. Um, augmenting their job so that they feel more comfortable in the workplace right there you know not working or not walking miles and miles a day within a warehouse just doing so many steps through picking or whatever task they're doing um, and I think that's kind of where the robotics comes into play there and then on the other side kind of the back end that AI where AI comes into this this marriage here uh, that, that you mentioned um, you know AI kind of comes into play I think to really be able to make those decisions about what's happening in the operation um, in, a, in a much faster way and a much proactive way, right? I think that, you know, and being a warehouse manager, you know, it, you can be like running around like crazy. Like, you know, it's just like you have these days where it just seems like everything that wants to go wrong goes wrong, right? Like, you know, maybe you have, you know, an issue with an employee or, you know, maybe the system goes down or, uh, you know, somebody drops a pallet off the forklift, you know, it, it just, you know, random things can happen. So so getting time to, to sit down and, you know, look at data and make data-based decisions, uh, oftentimes like that gets pushed and it gets pushed and it gets pushed. It's like, oh, well, uh, this is a project, like, so, you know, I can look at it like tomorrow uh, and then it's like tomorrow and then all of a sudden it's you know four or five weeks later and you know you still haven't looked at it but if you had the time to do that like you could have made a decision that you know for those four or five weeks could have potentially dramatically impacted your operation in a, in a positive way and that's where i think ai is going to come into play to be able to give that kind of warehouse manager supervisor uh, more power to be able to harness data and, and understand that because I, I think too in my experience um, you know a lot of times there's not that data analysis background for, for a warehouse supervisor or warehouse manager either um, and, and you know I've, I've managed supervisors and managed uh, managers that are like oh like I hate data or I hate Excel. Like, don't show me Excel, you know? <laughs> it's like, and I, I think like, you know, in that sense, like, I mean, I do like Excel and I do like data. You know, I'm totally outing myself as a, a nerd here on this podcast with you. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, you have that balance and, and I think it takes away like all of that because it takes time to do that data analysis. But with AI, I mean, you can do it incredibly quickly and you can even get to like what is that decision point and I think more and more companies like WMS companies are putting that into play and figuring out other ways to, to do things with AI so being able to kind of make those decisions quicker um, to also then benefit the employee I think like that's where you get that win-win where you know the employee themselves the worker on the floor is is happier because you know, their the job is becoming less strenuous. They're getting more productive, so you know they feel better about themselves. And then also, the management is able to make better decisions faster to also continue to make that work environment better for them and and be more efficient in the operation. I think that's kind of like where where that perfect marriage aligns in the the next five years, as as you mentioned. So it, it kind of sounds like with introducing. AI automation, robotics into warehousing, it sounds pretty similar to almost the, I guess, the light bulb moments and the, the fearful moments that's happening with AI and like content and writing and mm -hmm. marketing. It, it feels very similar where folks are feeling stressed out that they're going to lose their jobs. But it, in a lot of ways, AI is, is I mean, it, I, anecdotally, it's definitely helping me do my job faster on the content yeah. creation side of things. Uh, it, it, is that a fair comparison where it's almost like the, the same psychological things that are going on with robotics and automation and warehousing is the same thing that's going on with AI and content writers and just creatives in general? Yeah, I would say so because I, I think um... – you know, even if I look back when I started the podcast and started initially learning about this robotics automation side and very much the conversation was, you know, going to the dark warehouse, right? Where like, you know, there's maybe only a handful of, of people within the warehouse. And Is that what it's called? Automation. A dark warehouse? Yeah, yeah. Like huh. lights out warehouse, basically, right? Hmm. Like you don't need to have the lights on because nobody, no people are in there oh, wow. essentially. Creepy. Right? So, I mean, that was like a lot of the conversation in the beginning but i think like that idea of the lights out dark warehouse is 
pretty much I, I mean it's still there there's still companies that are like pushing towards that and, and working towards that um but that overall narrative and conversation has kind of uh, died down a lot and it's more on the collaborative side right like uh, you know you look at um like locus robotics probably the biggest one or, or six river you know they're uh notably known for having what they call a collaborative robot where you know the robot is collaborating with the human to be able to to move things um, and take away some of those the travel time and, and do things like that um, that the human you know essentially was kind of wasting time doing right where they could be you know grabbing items or, or doing something where you know they need to think um, hmm. so so yeah I mean I, I think that it, it is similar in that regard where you know a couple of years ago uh, when you're seeing robots people like were like oh this is going to take my job and stuff like that but I think that conversation has certainly uh, died down I mean obviously I think there's still some skepticism out there as I said before but yeah I mean I think it is very very similar to that as like you see more and more applications of collaborative efforts where people are realizing like oh okay like this is how they can help my operation um, get better without you know going in a totally kind of I don't know dystopian route or anything like that and you know going like full lights out and you know like kicking people out and all those types of things so so yeah I mean I, I think there is definitely some some parallels there in, in terms of the overall kind of uh, cultural reaction I guess you could say and so when I, I guess for a lot of, of warehouses it's very much maybe like a, a, a strong mix between those who have adopted you know new technology mm -hmm. for, for warehouses in general what is the table stakes is it just a, a WMS and I say just, you know, mm. kind of hi hyperbolic here, um, just yeah. because of the fact WMSs can be just so intricate. But is that sort of the only table stakes that exists in warehousing? Or is there other software that you kind of, you can't just like jump into, you know, buying a warehouse and, you know, opening one up? Or is it that easy? Uh, you could, I wouldn't advise <laughs> it, but <laughs> I, I mean, believe it or not, there's still, there are still operations out there that just kind of strictly run out of Excel, um, wow. and, you know, just utilize spreadsheets and, and, and for some operations, I, I would say that, you know, while I don't think it's a smart thing to do, um, because it is certainly opening yourself up to some risk and, you know, data loss and, and errors and things like that. But I, I mean, for some operations, I mean, it's, it, it's straightforward enough where you could easily manage it, um, in a spreadsheet. Like, uh, we had, um, one company I worked for, we, we subleased, um, uh, for the summer, we subleased like part of our warehouse to, uh, a water company. And I think they had like three SKUs and they loaded it up twice and moved it out twice. And, you know, you don't really need a WMS to, to do that. Like you, you can do that through a spreadsheet. So might tell you what the ship, when the ship it, and you know, you just pull that stuff. But, but more and more, I think the operations that we're, we're seeing, especially as um, we have, you know, more e-commerce coming into play, more omni-channel fulfillment, uh, you definitely need to have that foundational software to help make that run and, and manage that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, certainly the WMS is, is kind of the, the starting point for that. Um, and then I think it starts to branch out. I mean, there's there's a lot from a tech standpoint that you can do before you get to the point of getting a robot. Like, and, and you should do too. Like, you, um, I think one of my one of my favorite quotes uh, from uh, my podcast was from um, Mike Mike Field, of, uh, he's the CEO of uh, Raymond Corporation, a big forklift uh, company, and, and he said that you need to you need to optimize before you automate, basically, right? So, and, and basically, uh, he said that uh, I don't remember the quote verbatim; it was a long time ago. But uh, <laughs> he he basically said that like if you're taking a process that you're doing and the process is not optimized yet and it's not a great process yet and then you go to automate it like you're just automating a bad process like mm. you're not really going to get 
the results you're expecting from automation. So, so there's a lot of steps in between there. But uh, yeah, definitely that foundational component is is the WMS, um, and you need to understand like what are the capabilities of that WMS and how can that WMS grow and expand with you. So you see now, there's a lot of uh, cloud-based WMSs. Um, where you can add different components to the WMS as you need them, right? So, uh, like one of the big ones is uh, Manhattan, and I was just at their user conference uh, a couple months ago, and and you know they've since since uh, since moved to to cloud um, within the past couple of years, cloud-based system, and and they have multiple components. So like they have like the core WMS, but then you can just turn on certain aspects of the WMS because it's cloud-based, and then if you get bigger then like you can also tie in their TMS component and you can also tie in their YMS component um, they have the LMS component too as well and you as you start to grow like you can scale through that um, and there's and there's multiple others too that are, are doing similar things but that definitely is like that core foundation like get that WMS in there um, and then understand what can you do from there because if you just get a warehouse and you're like oh, I'm gonna put some robots on the floor, like, you know, the robots also need to like communicate with something, which is that, which is that system. And they need to understand like, where are the orders and, you know, where do I go for the orders and, and your WMS is kind of going to guide that. And, and some robotics companies have like built in uh, WMSs as well, or, or um, different types of systems that will navigate that. Um, but just starting out, like, yeah, you certainly need to, to get some kind of foundational system in place. What does that... If someone says like, oh, I want to add, I'm sure it's a much more um, complicated or intricate conversation than I just, you know, I want, I want to add robots to my warehouse. What yeah. does that, I guess, uh, th th what does the cost look like for something like that? Oh, the cost. I think ooh, that's hard to say because the cost is, I would say, all over the place. Um, like there's this really depends so, on your operation. Yeah. I mean, it depends on your operation. It depends on what. Uh, process you want to use robots for um, so like you know if you look at like a picking process like I think well for I think like pallet movement you know just moving pallets from like point A to point B um, was really kind of like that initial thing that got perfected I would say um, and then picking was really kind of the big next focus and I think that you know companies have kind of perfected what does that look like um, so like those ones that have been around for a while, like you're probably going to be easier to, to enter on those right from a cost perspective. Um, but then like some of the newer automation robotics that are coming out, like um, at Promat, one of the big things was that there was multiple companies for the first time showing uh, truck unloading robots mm. um, where they're unloading um, cartons from from either floor loaded containers or floor loaded trailers, um, which has been always like a very challenging task. Um, I would argue one of the one of the worst tasks to do in the warehouse <laughs> is unload a, a floor loaded container from overseas. It's just a, a nightmare because they stuff it like to the brim to maximize the cube, and you know, especially like if it's the winter, if it's the summer, it's like hot in the container, it's cold in the container. Um, you know, I don't, don't envy those guys that have to do that. So very long overdue automated, I will say that sidebar there, but, um, yeah, the, I think it, it depends on where you're looking to automate, um, and at what level. So like you have where you would get maybe like an auto store, which is an ASRS, um, automated shuttle retrieval system, uh, where, you know, you could be talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, potentially depending on how big you go. Uh, whereas, you know, you're looking at like, uh, I mentioned Locus and, you know, they have a robots as a service model where you're paying just like a monthly fee on that robot. And then you're able to, scale up and down depending on how many robots you need. So like if you're going through peak, like you can get an extra, you know, 20 robots in uh, because you're going to have more volume. And then after peak is over, like you can send them back. Um, and those prices vary too as well. But yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's all across the board um, to be but honest like with minimum, you. probably 500,000. 
Uh, well, no. If you're looking at like the uh, robots as a, a service type of model, um, I think like some of them are are in the hundreds per month or, or low thousands per month for for one robot. Um, but then you know you're you're limited to what can that robot do too. So I think like really to understand pricing, like you gotta pinpoint like okay what process do we want to focus on and then figure out like what are the companies we're going to go with and what are their pricing models because they've come up with so many different things like even um like i mentioned the auto store like they you know it's pretty uh pretty inaccessible for like a small shipper medium-sized shipper maybe even to make that type of investment in an auto store so they've actually come out with a, an offshoot company called PO. Um, which uses the same technology, um, but the price structure is, is way different. Like you're, you're not paying for this full on build out. Um, and then they have like a pay per pick model as well, um, which is pretty, pretty interesting um, approach to it. And, it. and it really lowers like that initial cost of trying to get into it. And then as your business grows, then you, you can essentially graduate from that to a full on auto store uh, system. So it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, and it, it, it's definitely a wide range of uh, pricing structures and, and numbers as well. And it, it, it sounds like, too, there there's more flexible options as well, because I, I just had somebody from um, Nimble on the podcast, Jonathan Briggs, and okay. he was talking about how they are just building their own warehouses, fully automatic, and if you want to try out, a, you as a shipper, you want to try out automation, Mm -hmm. uh, you can just ship your products to them and they will do it for you in their warehouse and versus you getting the space and setting it up yourself. And um, so I thought that that was a, a, a unique model too. So it sounds like there's a bunch of different options depending oh, yeah. on the level of where in the commitments, probably the real estate commitments that, that you're already, maybe you have, or maybe you don't want to get um, considering the market is so challenging right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's a lot of different models like, like the one you mentioned. Um, but for, for the, the real estate perspective, I think one of the, the interesting things about the automation and robotics, too, is, is there's a big focus on like maximizing cube and, and space like um, uh, like like the auto store. I mentioned mentioning them a lot, but um, it, like they can fit like so much more product in like a, a square footage aspect versus like if you were going to take that same square footage and and put racking in with pallets or, or shelving or something like that like they can it's pretty astounding like how much they could fit per square foot versus what you could fit in like a traditional rack or, or something mm. like that so oftentimes like it even though maybe your process is okay but you know you don't want to move to another building so you need more space like you might lean towards automation to be able to to maximize your queue better so so some of the solutions are uh, not only focused on uh, being more productive, but also helping you with uh, utilizing your your space in a in a better way and, and kind of maximizing that. Going back to your your podcast for a minute, do you have a favorite story that you told or a favorite interview? I'm sure they're all they're all your favorite children, but which which ones stick Ooh, out the most? I love them all. Uh, <laughs> Um, I have to say, I, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe it's, uh, my friends say I'm very, uh, nostalgic, but, uh, <laughs> I have to say like my first episode, I definitely was like, you know, one of my favorites, um, it was with Bruce Welty, um, who at the time, like I really hadn't, I mean, when I started the podcast, like I really was not very familiar with the industry at all. I mean, it was kind of self-serving in a way to learn more about the industry <laughs> uh yeah so so i i mean i was just kind of like trying to think like what would be an interesting first episode like what would get people's attention um so i thought like oh robots right like robots would get people's attention right so so i just searched on linkedin and uh i i cold uh cold emailed or, or linkedin message <laughs> uh whatever you call it uh uh, Bruce, uh, to see if he wanted to be a guest. And he said, yeah. Wow. Um, the rare and... cold DM on LinkedIn working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially <laughs> with someone with no like <laughs> pedigree or nothing. Um, so yeah. And I, like, 
And so he uh, talked about Locust Robotics. Um, he is actually one of the original founders of Locust Robotics. Um, and at the time, like, I thought that was cool or whatever. And then, you know, fast forward to now, like, I mean, Locust is like a, a unicorn in the space, you know, valued at over a billion dollars. And they've just kind of exploded and taken over, like, that uh, robotics space. Um, so I, I really didn't even realize, like, you know, uh, how, like, good of a get that was for a, a guest at the time. So I look back on that and say, like, oh, wow, like, that's, that was, like, really cool. Um, yeah, and I think it's just like that that moment of you know what what started it all is definitely leans it towards uh my favorite as well do you have um any other because marketing is a big part whether we mm -hmm. like it or not marketing is a big part <laughs> of podcast i guess distribution yeah do you have um sort of maybe like a light bulb moment for you that you were like this is actually working like this is this is Ooh, resonating. Yes, 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 yes. So first light bulb moment with the podcast uh, was, uh, it's funny, we were talking about the, the conferences and stuff before we started recording, but uh, so when I started in 2019, I think it was like first week of March or something, we, we released the first episode and... Um, and I say, well, I say we now because I have a team now, but then it was just me. Like I released the first episode, but uh, <laughs> how far we have come, right? Um, but <laughs> the, I, I was talking to somebody, uh, either somebody I had that it's like an interview on the podcast or just, you know, talking back and forth, trying to get them to be a guest. Um, they mentioned like, oh, are you going to go to uh, ProMat, right? And and honestly, like at that point, like I had never heard of, of ProMat, Um but, you know, trying to be, you know, cool with it, I was like, oh, I'm not sure yet, right? And then, you know, we get off the call quickly, like, jump on Google, like, from that was from that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so I found it, and, it, you know, it's like a huge conference for people that aren't, aren't familiar, um, all focused on material handling, uh, forklifts, robotics, WMS, you know, anything that would, you know, be around or in the warehouse, like, is pretty much there, um, and that's, like, kind of the conference to be at if you have some type of solution that involves material handling or, or warehousing um and huge too very very big um so i'm like oh wow like this this is where i need to be all right like this is like you know my mecca or whatever right like this is like the warehouse spot so uh so yeah i looked at it and i'm like oh like like should i go like you know how can i figure out how to go to this and then i kind of like looking around and i saw like oh they have a um, uh, press, right? So I'm like, oh, like technically I'm press now, I guess, right? Like I'm thinking like, oh, maybe I'm press. So I, like, let me sign up. So I signed up as press. Um, and yeah, like when I did that, I guess I got put on press list, uh, whatever they do. And man, like my inbox just <laughs> exploded, like with press releases, people saying like, oh, like, you know, how can we get on to interview and, and all these things. And I'm like, oh, like this is something, right? So I'm like, oh, this is actually gonna be like more than I expected. Like I thought like I would go out there and maybe I would have luck to talk to a couple of people. Um, and then all of a sudden, like I'm lining up like all these interviews and then I'm like, oh man, like, what am I going to do? Cause I'm not going to have any time to even like promote the podcast. I'm going to be talking to so many people. Uh, so I like, hired two people off Craigslist, like to <laughs> walk around with shirts on that said the new warehouse oh, and no hand way. out like, <laughs> uh, postcards. And, and then I was like, oh, like, uh, and, uh, there were two, um, younger girls actually in in college i think and uh and they had they've been doing like trade show kind of work part-time and i'm like i'm like what? you guys like yeah so they <laughs> a whole like, economy yeah well it was in uh chicago right so they you know, like mccormick place you know there's like huge uh conference scene there i guess or whatever you would call it um so they you know they would work booths and stuff like that like part-time while they're going through school a and, booth um, babe for logistics conferences yeah, well, they would work Whoa. all kinds of conferences. They really didn't know, like, what was going on in logistics world. But I was like, oh, like, you know what? Like, 
do you guys uh, use Instagram? And they're like, yeah, of course, like, duh, you know. Like, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I'm like, here, like, just log into the new warehouse Instagram account, which was like new, and I'm like, just do whatever you want to do. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so they like went and handled all that, and I just like did interview after interview after interview. I think in three days I did like That's 40. Awesome. <laughs> I think I did like 40 some interviews in three days, like Whew. just wild. And uh, yeah, and that like when I did that um that was kind of like a big light bulb moment that like oh like if i can tap into like these conferences trade shows like on the press side like then i can get some credibility um uh, but i can also get like a lot of inbound too like people interested um because they want to talk about their thing and they want different outlets to to do their thing so that was like big time light bulb there like kind of in the beginning um and you know since and then since i've been to multiple conferences and um you know after that pro mat like i was i was running around with a little handheld uh recorder actually i have it right here Zoom? Like, this was yeah this was me like just nice <laughs> running booth to booth to booth to booth right on my feet like all three days like all day long and um and then after that i was able to develop a relationship with um MHI, who are the organizers, and you know they've they've set me up with a, a booth for Promat and Modex and stuff to sit down and you know have interviews and things like that. So that was certainly a big time uh, light bulb moment, I would say, um, in the beginning there from like a marketing outreach, not only creating awareness, but then also you know getting guests to additionally. And like I think since that has happened. Um, it's pretty rare that like I reach directly out to someone to, to come on the podcast, actually. That's awesome. It's kind of full circle. Like we started off the yeah. show talking about the conference sign in the background and oh, then yeah. how the conference <laughs> has been your, your the big light bulb moment for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and since then and in the last year, getting to go to more conferences, I mean, it's just kind of it's just helped grow a lot because there's a lot more networking and you know being able to talk to people and uh, i'm sure you probably see this too like the podcast is kind of like a, it's like a gateway to introductions right and it's kind of uh it's very interesting um and i i mentioned this the other day to um uh, I think, you know, you know, Nate, Nate shoots, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. We were talking the other day, we were talking about podcasting as well, you know, shop talk. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I was like, you know, one thing like I heard kind of like towards the beginning, um, cause I was watching, you know, I was trying to figure out like, how do I market this and all these things. I was watching a lot of, a lot of Gary Vee at that time. I really don't, don't do that much anymore, but, uh, at the time. And I remember the one thing he said that stuck out to me was like, if you create a podcast or you create a video series something like that all of a sudden you become that kid in high school that had the house where you could have parties at right it's like everybody wants to be your friend everybody wants to talk to you you know everybody wants to come to the party right so to speak so so i, I think once that realization kind of happened like that was like really a big kind of springboard to like oh okay like i can you know approach some people now that maybe you know if i was just i was just kevin right like just the regular guy uh no podcast like uh, they would be like who are you like you know what why do you want to talk to me <laughs> like uh but now there's like kind of that thing that kind of greases the wheels a little bit from a, a marketing perspective and I, I think that helps things go like even further than i thought it would ever go for sure. I think podcasts are, you know, I, I heard someone say it recently and I can't remember who, uh, but they said podcasting is building relationships at scale. And right. I think that that is just such a, it's a, such a unique way to connect with other people. It's such a unique way to connect with your audience because they've got your show in their ears and they're, you know, bath time to the kids or they're cooking dinner or cleaning the house yeah. or laundry and, and you're in their ears. It's such a unique and intimate medium versus, you know, say like a TikTok, for example, where you're just right. like a zombie looking at it for, you know, <laughs> however many hours until you get the warning from the TikTok people that say you've been scrolling for too long. <laughs> and it's like you come out of the trance and it's like, okay, yeah. but podcasting very much like complements people's lives instead of interrupts it, which is the part of the the original reason of why I fell in love with it. But as, as I've got you, cause I got a, a, just a couple more like rapid fire questions that I wanted to ask sure, you. Um, 
these are questions that I, I've started asking, especially over the last like month. I've started asking each guest. So um, it's been really interesting Ooh, to hear gosh. each of their answers. Um, so first up is, how do you think about marketing your podcast versus marketing yourself? Ooh, that is a very interesting one. Um, because I, I have been, especially as I, I said, I think I mentioned earlier, like been really focused on you know LinkedIn and, and trying to time to get the podcast growing on there and it's kind of like there is that balance a little bit between uh you know what do i post as myself or what do i post as the new warehouse um but i i think that i've come to a point where it's like okay like i'm molding the two together like it's just like kind of one overall brand um but i do definitely i do definitely kind of pick and choose like what kind of, what what messaging do I want to put out as like me versus like oh, okay like this is gonna be a post on like my profile versus like okay this is gonna be a post through the new warehouse profile or new warehouse page um so yeah it's, it's difficult but it's always like uh it's like I think like if I intro to somebody uh, I think it's always like uh podcast first right and then it's like oh and then you know and then I do these other things too right but right now it's like podcast first um and then you know i kind of i guess benefit a little bit personally off of that from from the personal brand perspective but it's very much um focused on pretty much the new warehouse i would say like 85 percent of the time it's like the the superman shirt under the clark kent get up <laughs> it's like at some point <laughs> it just bit, merges yeah. together and you got to play both sides <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't hide it anymore. Okay, next one. <laughs> uh, favorite social media platform and why? Uh, LinkedIn definitely is my, is my favorite. Um, I think that um, it's just been so interesting, and I think it's just like such an interesting way to connect with people um, because there's, you know, it's very. It, I think. LinkedIn, I find it like it's very easy to find people that are like in the same arena as you. Um, so it's been very cool to like find that. And then, you know, people, I think people like post some really, you know, there's certainly some stuff on there now that's like, eh, okay. And, you know, <laughs> but there's certainly like okay. a lot of like very insightful stuff on there too that, you know, some people post about not only like just our arena, like logistics, warehousing, but then like from like a, a branding marketing perspective too, um, which, you know, to you and I is, is very important as well, as we just mentioned in that question. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's definitely LinkedIn because I've met a lot of people through LinkedIn, like virtually, um, and then met them in person, like at conferences and things. And it's like, oh, like, you know, it's like, we're the best of friends, right? It's really, um, really been a lot to, to, for me to initially figure out LinkedIn, like how to use it in that way. Um, but I really enjoy kind of being on that platform and, and just kind of the, the opportunities, not only to connect, but also to, to learn from there as well. For sure. I, I think it's, it's, I've always called it like the digital handshake that turns into yeah, real world good. connections. And so we'll, we'll actually, you know, we, we, we talked before we started recording that we'll actually get to meet each other for the first time at yes. CSCMP. It's coming up in Orlando and then also uh, Manifest. So uh, Manifest end of January, early February. So quick plug for the both of those conferences that, that we'll be at. Yeah. So, and when Blythe is there, we're going to get her on our live stream at yeah. CSCMP Edge <laughs> in October. So definitely tune in for that. Heck yes. <laughs> uh, already signing up for that. So, uh, okay, final one. Um, oh, wait, no, I lied. I had two more. Uh, favorite social account to follow and why? It can be in the industry or outside of the industry. Oh, man, that's hard. You have to pick favorite <laughs> this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. I will say, like, on LinkedIn, I, I was a uh, big... Uh, I mean, I guess I'm still a fan, um, but I was really into um, Justin Welsh for a mm -hmm. while, his account, like um, really kind of, especially like when I decided to, to leave uh, my, my previous job and, you know, do the entrepreneur thing, like his whole concept of solopreneur um, was very interesting. Some of the ways that he's not only talking about how to manage it, but then also having like that balance with, with life. Um, yes. So that was definitely a, a big favorite follow. Um, 
and then within the I think within like our arena um, I really like following um, uh, the Ecom Logistics podcast guys uh, like Harshida and Dan and, and Nanad um, from Fulfillment IQ like I think they I mean they have a great podcast too and and but on LinkedIn like they really post like really some really kind of insightful posts um, from like a supply chain perspective that I think is really really interesting super cool I I hadn't heard of them so I, I've heard of the fulfillment IQ but I didn't know the names behind it so I'm gonna make a note to check them out afterwards oh okay. definitely yeah I'll intro to you I know them well and then final rapid fire question favorite SaaS tool that you can't live without favorite SaaS tool I can't live without mm. uh, can't be your own can't be my own unless uh, you got if you guys have like a WMS or anything no, we don't have our own, so it's not that. <laughs> um, uh, oh, let's. Oh, I would say, I guess Calendly would Calendly be a SaaS product, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that for all the podcast scheduling, um, because yeah, in the beginning before Calendly, like it was so much <laughs> back and forth emails, and now I'm like, here's the link, right? Yes. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I mean that certainly. Uh, is probably the best one and then we use um, I would probably say like close second if not tied would just be like the Google uh, workspace suite in general uh, like I, I live by my Google calendar so uh, yeah that's that's definitely up there all right and then fi I guess second to the last question what else is going on in either like your world of podcasting, warehouse management, warehouse operations? What's going on in your world that you feel like is important to mention that we haven't already talked about? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we briefly talked about um, the, the fulfillment center um, and, and the 3PL services, but we, uh, as I mentioned, we moved into a, a new space here in New Jersey um, and we have a lot of space. Actually, we've partnered with uh, another 3PL called Xperia Global, um, which has allowed us to offer a lot more services from like a transportation perspective, um, B2B distribution, um, and really gives us a lot more bandwidth to do things within those kind of fulfillment 3PL services. Um, so yeah, so if anybody's looking for a, a 3PL or a fulfillment center to, to uh, operate for them, uh, we could definitely handle that and, and do that now. So, so reach out if, if you're interested in that. Uh, absolutely. And, and I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes so folks can sure. check that out if they're interested. But I, I, I lied about, you know, second to the last question because now I have another one. <laughs> um, what outside of like the big retailers like a Walmart or Amazon, mm -hmm. um, Target, who is taking up the most warehouse space in like North America? Ooh, that's a good question, actually. Um, is it like car makers or I, uh, I don't know if they actually store cars and warehouses though i doubt i don't think they do no i mean cars themselves no but parts um definitely would would take up a lot of space but i i think if i had to say and don't quote me on this because i don't have the data in front of me or anything like that but i would have to say just um 3pl is like e-commerce fulfillment probably consumer uh, cpg um hmm. stuff just because the sheer volume of e-commerce volume that's going on now. Um, and there is like so many 3PLs out there. I mean, we, we hear about like the big ones like DHL and all that stuff, but there's so many like small, medium sized ones. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would say like definitely those product mixes are probably taking up the the most space i would say in the the country right now i think and then most densely uh kind of packed and in demand is on the the cold side refrigerated frozen side because there's just like such a lack of space for those things um mm -hmm. especially with the rise of like grocery fulfillment and things like that so so that's where I would say, um, but I can't say that that is the 100% truth to the data point. Well, it sounds believable, <laughs> so I'm buying it. 
<laughs> I convinced you. Okay, that's good. Yes, I'm like, yeah, that sounds, yeah, that, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kevin, th- this has been an awesome discussion. Um, where can folks, I mean, I'll be sure to link to it, of course, but, you know, sure. for the sake of, of folks who are listening and watching, where can they follow your work, subscribe to the podcast, check out your fulfillment services, um, get some warehouse space? Where, where can they find you? Yeah, I mean, uh, LinkedIn, definitely. As I mentioned, you can find me on LinkedIn, either under uh, Kevin Lawton or, or The New Warehouse. Um, and then you could just head to thenewwarehouse.com for all things The New Warehouse and through the podcast. Uh, anywhere you can listen to a podcast, we are. And I always tell people, if you listen to podcasts somewhere and we are not there, please tell me because we will get there. <laughs> Oh, this is great. This is awesome. We, we covered a lot of ground in, yeah. in this conversation. We talked about the state of warehousing. We talked about content creation, um, podcasting, of course, conferences, um, robotics. Um, we covered a lot of ground. So I'm, I'm happy that this conversation finally got started. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Blythe, for having me on. And, and definitely uh, thank you for putting out the content that you do, too. Um, I listen to your podcast all the time. It's in my... Uh, ongoing rotation and really some great conversations and i love the love the perspective from you know what's going on in in the industry and then also from the marketing perspective weaved in there too as well i think it's a really um kind of unique mix and and something that the industry needs so definitely uh, appreciate you putting it out thank you so much the the check is in the mail as soon as the show is over all right ready to cash it (laughs) 